Good morning. My name is Thurman Barnes. I'm the Assistant Director of the New Jersey Gun Violence Research Center, and I have the distinct honor of introducing our first keynote speaker. Dr. Joseph Richardson is the Joel and Kim Feller Professor of African American Studies and Medical Anthropology at the University of Maryland, and one of eight scholars selected as an inaugural University of Maryland Empower Professor. Empower is a collaboration between the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and the University of Maryland College Park to strengthen Maryland's innovation economy, advance interdisciplinary research, and solve important problems for the people of Maryland and the nation. Dr. Richardson is the lead epidemiologist for the Violence Prevention Program, a hospital-based violence intervention program at the Center for Injury Prevention and Policy, University of Maryland R. Adams Cowley Shock Trauma Center, where he leads a research team that investigates the causes and collateral consequences of gun violence, violent injury, and community trauma in Baltimore. He is the executive director of the Transformative Research and Applied Violence Intervention Lab, a multidisciplinary violence research lab at the University of Maryland College Park. Dr. Richardson is the executive producer and director of the award-winning digital storytelling project, Life After the Gunshot, which explores the lives of 10 young black male survivors of violent firearm injury in Washington, DC. Dr. Richardson, welcome and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Thurman, for, for having me. And also thank you to the New Jersey Gun Violence Research Center for inviting me today. And I would also like to thank my alma mater, Rutgers University School of Criminal Justice, where I received my master's and my PhD. So it's, it's great to be back at Rutgers to give this presentation. So this presentation will cover my work, which focuses on uh, gun violence and trauma among young black men in Washington, DC. And I think it's a, a great place to have this conversation primarily because Washington DC is the, the nation's capital. And we can also use it as a litmus test for where we are in terms of gun violence in this country. And so this uh, presentation will weave in video clips from my digital story, my digital story project, Life After the Gunshot, and I will also walk through issue, uh, issues around structural violence as well as interpersonal violence and, and hopefully at the end provide some solutions with how we can address gun violence, not only in the, the nation's capital, but also in uh, around the country as well. So my work uh, crosses the boundaries between the academy and the streets. And I think it's critically important that we uplift and, and recognize that black men, particularly young black men, have uh, gun violence has consistently been the leading cause of death among young black men for decades. And as we can see, this is, this is data provided by uh, Giffords, which is, indicates that black men make up almost 60% of all gun homicide victims, despite comprising less than 7% of the U.S. population. 35% from 2019 to 2020, since you can see that. And then this is me in Southeast DC. And in terms of just going into the neighborhoods and understanding the social context of the way that young uh, black men experience gun violence, what we use is a digital storytelling approach. And you can see my research team here. This is uh, Marcus, my cameraman, and on the, on the left with the hat, sitting against the wall is my, my uh, collaborator and research partner, Che Bullock. And we use digital storytelling as an approach to understanding um, the social context of gun violence. And so again, DC has the second highest rate of gun violence in the country. And this is where we are, were in 2020 in terms of, of, of homicides. Uh, we had 198 homicides in 2020 and 922 people shot. And again, I just want to make note of the increase in the number of black women who were victims of homicide in 2020. And you can see the change between 2019 and 2020 with the increase from 12 to 29, which is roughly 142% increase in the number of black women who were victims of homicide. And that, that trend 
uh, we're experiencing uh, across the nation. And I know in Philadelphia, as well as Baltimore, Maryland, we have seen a significant increase in the number of Black women who are fatally and not fatally uh, shot. And so in DC, um, in 20 and 2021, you can see here that we are trending upwards in terms of homicides. We had 226 in 2021, but we're also trending upwards in 2022. We have an increase of 4%, but I want to make note of the, the significant increase in the number of robberies. So here we have uh, in 2021, we had a 2% increase in robberies. But if you look at where we are in 2022, we're at 47%. And that is uh, much of that is attributable to the significant increase in the number of carjackings that we're seeing in the district. And so in, in terms of what my work really tries to uncover, these are all the shootings on the left in, in 2020, 2020, in terms of the shootings in Washington, DC. And we can see that they're concentrated on the uh, eastern side of the city, which is east of the river, if you look at DC as a quadrant. So in the northeast and southeast sections, we see a concentration of shootings. And then we also see a concentration primarily in the center of the city in those clusters. But it's, it's important for me as an ethnographer to really get described what's happening underneath these dots, because there are thousands of people who have been exposed to uh, homicides as well as non-fatal shootings. And, and those individuals that live underneath these dots are often experiencing significant levels of trauma that may go undiagnosed and untreated. One of the ways, again, is the way I, that I get to these, these issues is I use an approach called digital storytelling. And this is me behind the camera filming. Um, this is Che Bullock in one of my interviews who I work with. But I try to use digital storytelling because I, I, I know as an ethnographer, it's been very challenging to get the messaging out of what's really happening in terms of gun violence. And I believe that we need to move beyond keeping our data behind a paywall. And so we, so digital storytelling provides a way and a means that's accessible to a broader population of people that they can access these stories on YouTube, they can access them on our website and on social, other social media platforms. And so we can get, get away from uh, a broader population of people not having access to this data because that data is hidden behind a paywall and inaccessible to the public. Uh, fortunately, the, uh, our digital storytelling project has gained a significant amount of traction. And this is uh, myself, Che Bullock, who again is the researcher practitioner on our project. And on the left is uh, Slim, is one of the, the young men who participated in the project. And we were interviewed by NPR here and now. A, a critical and significant aspect of gun violence and I may be preaching to the choir, but understanding the symptoms of traumatic stress and, and what that looks like. And for the many of the young men that we work with, the symptoms of traumatic stress parallel the symptoms that we would see among young men and women who have engaged in combat in the theater in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria. And so uh, part of our study was to uncover how young uh, black men who have been violently injured experience traumatic stress. And this is a clip, a short one uh, minute, one and a half minute clip from our project where one of the young men describes his symptoms of traumatic stress. <laughs> The car pull up, they enter the parking lot, get the sprint 56 times. We thought it was firework. It wasn't. We started hitting them ricocheted off the wall. It was real. I didn't know I was shot until I got around the corner. I felt a cramp. Then my hand got real hot because of the blood. I looked down, I got shot. I passed out about two, three times. <laughs> 
family members came into the hospital. Got out the next day. It was war time. I'd say for the guys that we work with, um, hypervigilance is the main symptom. And hypervigilance is the feeling of I'm not safe. I just moved into my own little spot. I hear little noises. I be thinking it's something else, a whole nother ball game. I'm way out Merlin. By the time I get halfway through the hallway, I'm like, man, lay your ass back down, man. Like, real life, man. I'm getting used to it, man. I'm get, I got to get back used to being comfortable. That's what it is. I was comfortable in the streets. Got shot. Now I got to get comfortable with just chilling. You know what I'm saying? Working, doing what I got to do. Hypervigilance is under hyper arousal, which means that the nervous system is stuck in fight mode. So the person is always amped up. They're argumentative. They're um, easily triggered. Anything that someone says to them, they go from, you know, having a moment of calm to a moment of intense anger and rage. What other ways did it, did it change you? My attitude, definitely. My eating habits, my breathing, my anxiety. Mainly anger, though. Were you more angry after that? Yeah. I'm still working on it, but yeah. So in our work, we we focus on the ways that young men experience trauma, but also using their narratives to provide. Uh, psychological support and through the through uh, the approach of cognitive behavioral therapy but we also want to get at uh, adverse childhood experiences and so on on the left you have a study that was done by Penn which found that even young children who are experience who experience gun violence in their neighborhoods and they could live even four to five blocks away from where a shooting occurs the increase the, the exposure to chronic uh, violence, increases the number of ED visits um, at following incidents of neighborhood gun violence. And so I also want to contextualize that trauma is not necessarily post. <clears throat> trauma occurs throughout the life course and there's a continuum of trauma. So when we talk about post-traumatic stress, we really need to be really cognizant of whether there is a post or, or pre because Adverse childhood experiences begin very early on in life. And what we find is that gun violence is just one event on the continuum of trauma that has occurred in the life course of the young men that we work with. And so it, it's important to uplift that. Here on the right is Slim, and this is from uh, a report in every town that I, that I authored. And his quote here is, the generation is in a cycle now the kids that's being born in my neighborhood, they're growing up to the beefs that we started. They're traumatized right now. They don't know it though. I was once them, I was him, I was her. I know what they're about to go through. So again, we, we want to uplift in our work, the adverse childhood experiences and how we can begin to move further upstream to, to diagnose and treat adverse childhood experiences. So those don't, behaviors don't manifest in adulthood. So here's a, a rough, some rough footage and, and our psychotherapist, Edward McCurdy, as well as uh, our ED physician, Kyle Fisher, uh, who were uh, members of our hospital violence intervention program uh, at the University of Maryland Prince George's Hospital Center are describing adverse childhood experiences. When you've had a traumatic experience, it, it affects the way your brain functions and uh, you carry the traumatic memory of that experience with you for the rest of your life. It wasn't until World War II and World, maybe it was World War I where I started getting this idea of post-traumatic stress syndrome. But the problem with that for a lot of our patients is just the term itself makes it sound like everything is fine, something bad happened, and then there was an after. And for our patient, it was just a false, a false construct. You know, is there a pre? We talk to our patients and 
uh, a lot of our patients, they've seen people get shot. Uh, they uh, have been exposed to, may have been exposed to abuse, uh, are exposed to poverty, uh, exposed to drugs and other things. And then they get injured and then they get injured and patched up and discharged back to the communities that they came from where they're worried they're going to get injured again. And many of them do. So is there even a pre or a post? It's, you know, chronic traumatic stress and we're still trying to figure out how to wrap our minds around how do you treat that? I lost my first friend to gun violence when I was 10, he was 12. Um, and so that started sort of the process for me, like personally, prior to that, people, men in my community had died of gun violence and being shot. But I remember distinctly my man Charles um, got killed when, we, when I was 10 years old. And then after that, my uncle Tyrone got killed when I was 12. And big homie Poochie got paralyzed around the same time. And then like, consistently after that just every like all the time somebody was getting shot and somebody was getting killed they took me away from my mother when i was 11 months old so i never even got to get like first christmas with my dudes for real like you know what i'm saying it's a first birthday none of that so, so i had broken ribs i had a broken leg broken nose a baby broken arm like you know what i'm saying like it's, it's crazy I can't pick my daughter in my arms i can't hold her my daughter notices it too. She want me to pick her up. I leave out now, like, I leave out now, if I go out, she don't want me to leave. I get called like two seconds and I called the door. I gotta tell her I'm coming back. After I just told her I was coming back before I went out the door, she cried. That shit fucks me up. The therapist told me that. So those are just some clips of, um, and unfortunately, I don't know why one of the young men had his head cut off in the in the in the video. But what I what we really try to get at in here is how young men and their children experience adverse childhood ex experiences during early on in their lives and even for young men who have been injured we're seeing that uh their children are often experiencing adverse child experiences knowing that their their father and their uh their father has been shot so it, in terms of structural violence our work also dives into uh the social determinants of health and one of the measures of structural violence is life expectancy in here an article published in the Washington Post suggests that black men in DC are expected to die 17 years earlier than white men. And here are some of the social determinants of health in Washington, DC, which impacts that we have employment and income, housing, food environment, which is critically important, medical care. Many of our young men live in medical deserts as well as food deserts, and then community safety. And so if you hear on the left are all images, in my estimation, of structural violence. We have uh, an enslaved African with uh, scars on his back, young, young black men in a chain gang, and then we, which has uh, transitioned to what we know now as the prison industrial complex a young man showing scars on, on the right side of his body from a gunshot wound. But on the bottom, we have uh, the Flint water crisis. And then on the right, we have Hurricane Katrina. And so we cannot talk about interpersonal violence without having a discussion regarding structural violence and what that means when social institutions harm people by preventing them from achieving their basic needs. And the way that this often plays out is that structural violence will kill far more people than interpersonal violence in this country. And here we have in Washington, DC, uh, in terms of life expectancy, you have Woodley Park, which is affluent, a white affluent neighborhood in Northwest DC, and the life expectancy is 89.4 years. And if you move, you go over to St. Elizabeth, which is on east of the river, which is predominantly poor and black, you see that you lose 21 years of 
of, of life expectancy. And on the right, as income grows, life expectancy increases. But what I, what I really find fascinating is, and if you look on this map, and I'll try to point out to you, Woodley Park is here. This is where uh, the, the life expectancy is 89.4 years. And this is the DC Metro. And if you just travel along the Metro and get down to Congress Heights, and I hope you can follow this arrow where I'm here, that's 11 stops. So in roughly 11 stops in a 43 minute ride in DC, you lose roughly 21 years of your life. So race, place and life expectancy in Washington DC as well as across the nation is an important issue that we need to pay attention to. Again, um, these maps, the map on the left shows uh, the concentration of public housing and food deserts which are marked in the in the red and uh as you see as we get to the east of the river there are far more clusters of concentrated public housing in washington dc as we move further in northwest dc over here we see that zoning policies are, are favor more single family housing and then how does this play out in terms of uh disproportionate uh health outcomes we know that in dc our COVID fatality rate is six times higher than for white washingtonians uh, the increase in poverty among Black Washingtonians has increased significantly since 1970. And then that ultimately plays out in terms of housing policies such as redlining, which has led to a net worth of white Washingtonians having a net worth, household worth of $284,000 to Black Washingtonians who have a net worth of $3,500, 81 times more. Uh, in terms of the school to prison pipeline in DC, uh, we know that black students are 15 times more likely to be suspended and why that's so important in terms of uh, gun violence. As a co-chair for the DC Violence Fatality Review Committee, there are three things that we find among young people who we review in DC that have been uh, killed by gun violence. And the three things that significantly stand out are one, um, they're often are true and in school Two, they have undiagnosed and untreated mental health disorders. And then three, they were involved in the juvenile justice system. And so as we push more black students into the juvenile justice system through the school to prison pipeline, that contributes to early violent mortality that we're seeing in DC among young people who are being killed in their early twenties. So we need to do more work moving upstream to provide interventions to divert these young people from going into the juvenile justice system and increasing the level of resources that they have in order to have successful youth outcomes. But the criminal justice system plays a critical role in, in gun violence, and we often do not acknowledge that. In DC, an average of 45 Black people are stopped and frisked every day uh, compared to just two Washingtonians. And this is a, a a report from the DC Metropolitan Police Department stop uh, report. And you can see, although Black Washingtonians represent 46 of the percent of the population, they're 86 percent of all the stops. Nine out of 10 people who are stopped for any one of these uh, reasons on the right are Black Washingtonians. Right. And this, again, the hyper surveillance of black Washingtonians pushes them into the criminal justice system in terms of uh, legalized marijuana. The district it has uh, legalized marijuana for several years, but black Washingtonians, 90 percent of them are overrepresented as arrested for charges on marijuana, which ultimately leads to D.C. having some of the highest incarceration rates in the world. Ultimately, in terms of gun violence, what we found is that a history of incarceration among Black men in Baltimore was the number one risk factor for bringing them back to the hospital. And why that happens is primarily the collateral consequences of felony disenfranchisement. Because once you have a felony, it's very difficult to get a job. It's very difficult to get uh, housing. It's also difficult to get a federal student loan. 
on the right is Diva Pager, a uh, sociologist who conducted uh, a seminal study on the impact of the labor market, uh, the impact of a felony record on labor market outcomes. And what she ultimately found sending out groups of white and black men with the same resumes, and she would give one of the, one of the men a record and the other person would not have a record at all. What she ultimately found is that white applicants who she attributed a record on their CV had uh, a greater likelihood of getting a call back for a job than a black male with no record at all, which ultimately what uh, Professor Pager suggested is, is that being black and male in the United States is equivalent to having a felony. And these things push young black men back into lifestyles where they need to survive for economic survival. And so in DC, as in many other cities, what we're seeing is uh, an increase in the number of jump outs. Uh, and these are plainclothes police officers who often uh, target young black men in many low income neighborhoods. And they're known for jumping out on uh, corners on young black men and searching them for guns and drugs. And in many situations, uh, we have jump out squads who are not identifying themselves. And so here is uh, an article where I'm cited in the Washington Post discussing the impact of jump outs in black communities. On the right, you have a 12 year old who was killed by a play closed unit um, in, in South Philadelphia recently, uh, TJ Sidario. And here on the, on the left is uh, from the new HBO series, we, we Own the City. And that's a fictional account of the actual uh, gun, tra uh, gun trace task force in Baltimore, and these are these are the real detectives and officers who were convicted of uh, corrupt practices in Baltimore, planting drugs and guns on uh, residents of Baltimore City. Again, in New York City in 2020, they disbanded these plainclothes units because they were engaged in, in uh, a number of unconstitutional practices. But then in 2022, uh, Mayor Eric Adams has uh, revived the anti-gun units, even though they have a notorious reputation in the past. And so here is a, a clip of a young man in, in our study who discusses how he was injured by a jump out squad. So when you got shot in March of 2015, what was the day like then? It's just, you know, when they shot, I knew I was hit all the break. I got hit. I was the first one out of the crowd. Got hit. Nah, got shot in the arm. So I knew I was hit. Was they just firing at the crowd? Nah, it was just, they were just coming out of nowhere. We didn't know who they was. We just thinking like, well, they had no police to say police on they on they vest or nothing like that. So when they came up, we just, we didn't know who they was. So right. we just got to shoot first. Okay. You know? The they, whole time is the police, so the police shot started shooting. How often do the police do that in hoods? It's like run up, you don't know who they are. They're just running up on you. They're not saying, "Yo, we the police, no badges, no nothing." Yeah, they do that. They do that now. You know, in DC, they do that now. They be doing that. It's called a gun unit. The elite gun recovery unit's mission is to get illegal guns off the streets, but recently their tactics have come under scrutiny. So they just hop out on your ass for guns, make you lift your shirt and stuff up or see if you got a gun or something on you or something like that. But they doing it now because they wear regular clothes, so you don't know what's going on. Anything can happen. Exactly. That's you why that's saying? the point I was trying to get to. So you don't really know. That can happen to anybody on anybody. any given day. It only got to be no street person. It could be a regular person that got a whole job. It could be a lawyer person. It could be anybody. You don't know. Anything can happen. So again, this young man was shot six times by the police. Um, they were unidentified. Again, they got into a shootout. He ends up being injured. He has to wear a colostomy bag for three and a half years. And he also does three and a half years in federal prison for that incident. And we see that happening a number of times with the young men who are coming into our trauma unit who have been injured. 
And so I'm going to move towards closing so I can take some questions in the Q&A, but I just want to raise uh, again, the co economic cost of gun violence in here, you see that it's $280 billion during the recession. And this is the budget for DC. And we see in 2021, uh, the approved budget was 500 and almost $46 million. But if we look at about the, the money that is spent on the investment in uh, violence intervention and prevention services, we see that it's roughly $15 million. So again, we're not taking the, the burden of the cost of gun violence and what we're doing to prevent it from a public health approach is not equivalent to the approach that we're using in terms of investment for law enforcement. Uh, this is DC where we have uh, violence intervention programs and the, the black dots represent homicides. And as you can see, there are many black dots in areas where there are no uh, violence intervention programs, and there are significant black dots in, in areas where there are violence intervention programs. And so what we need to do is, A, begin to understand the impact of these programs and what we found in previous studies, that it's a mixed bag in terms of do violence intervention programs really work, but we have not, we have not engaged in enough evaluation of these programs to make uh, conclusive, uh, conclusive remarks in terms of uh, whether these programs are working, and, and what impact that they're having in the reduction of violence in, in our cities. And so ultimately uh, my work culminated, this is my mentor, Dr. Carnell Cooper, who started violence, hospital violence intervention program at University of Maryland Shock Trauma. And this is myself on the right uh, in, uh, at the University of Maryland Prince George's Hospital Center where I co-founded a hospital violence intervention program there, the Capital Region Violence Intervention Program. And then ultimately what we did uh, was, our goal was to reduce the number of people who returned to the hospital for violent injury. And here you can see in, in terms of GSWs in 2017, there were 230 and by 2020, there were 333, which uh, just gives an indication of the ways that gun violence increased between 2017 and 2020 and why 2020 recorded the highest number of fatal and non-fatal shootings recorded by the CDC. And so this is what we did. We provided services in form of trauma-informed care, cognitive behavioral therapy, employment, uh, housing assistance, which was very difficult to do, uh, legal assistance, and then peer support. We had 116 participants, and in a two-year period from 2017 to 2019, we had one person return for a violent injury, which is a trauma recidivism rate of less than 1%, which is quite significant. But what I would say is that in terms of evaluations of hospital violence interventions, again, like uh, community violence intervention programs, the results are very mixed and we need more studies to determine the impact of what works and what doesn't work in terms of violence intervention. So this is just, uh, some of the studies that we've published on the Credible Messenger and the ways that this person engages in the lives of, of our violently injured patients. Uh, we also used Uber Health uh, to transport young men from their homes to our services, which was a, a, a mechanism that we used to provide trauma-informed care. And then on the right, we also uh, published an article on how we can improve enrolling young black men who are injured into healthcare insurance. So they leave the hospital insured so they can be more connected to the healthcare system. And then ultimately uh, one of my studies focused on how hospitals can provide missing data for police involved shootings and the ways that uh, medical staff can use the ICD-10 to, to code for police involved shootings because at the time that I was conducting this work, we had absolutely no idea how many people were not fatally shot by the police every year. And so my, my studies that I'm conducting now, one focuses on black men and mental health and the ways that they experience trauma. But what's interesting about this study is that we're using a virtual ethnography and giving all of our participants Chromebooks. And then my other study focuses on black women who have been killed and we're interviewing uh, or have been injured by gunshot 
uh, through community violence and not related to DV or IPV. And we're also going to be interviewing and longitudinally following uh, young black women in Baltimore who have experienced uh, non-fatal shooting. And then uh, my last study focuses on uh, looking at the vi Victor offender overlap and how many of our patients who we work with who have been injured have come into the trauma unit have also uh, been uh, both in front of and behind the gun. So we need more funding for, for violence intervention efforts in this country. And uh, one of the ways is that we can continue to advocate for that on the, both the state and federal level. And then finally, we need to have more research for our work. And this is the dollars by death rate. And as you can see, gun violence research is significantly underfunded. And then finally, um, the, the one of the approaches that I'm using now, now with my colleagues, we're doing uh, peer healing groups that are virtual. We have virtual sessions uh, that address stigma accessibility and are culturally tailored to young black men who have been injured. Uh, we have facilitators, a psychotherapist, violence intervention specialist, a conflict manager specialist and myself as a gun violence researcher. And we've, we've been quite successful in using this virtual approach, which we decided to implement during COVID. And what we found using this approach, even though we had 12 sessions, is that every single person in our group attended all 12 sessions. And so we are on our second cohort now, and we are also transcribing our focus groups, which we conducted too with with that co with our first cohort, and hopefully we'll find we'll have some uh, publications coming out from that very soon. And so I'd like to dedicate this to Marge Powers, my presentation. It's myself and our violence intervention specialist with Marge, and this is in uh, this was in June of 2019. And as you can see, unfortunately, uh, on Tuesday, November 12th of 2019, he was murdered. And so we, I dedicate all of our work to him and to his family, and, and hopefully our work can prevent other Marges from the world from being uh, killed. Thank you. Great presentation and very powerful, Dr. Richardson. Uh, we do have a question, but also a point of clarification. I think it's, it's, uh, it's true here. It says, uh, did you say that while Black males are only 7% of the population, they were 60% of all gun victims. I believe that to be true. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we have a question here. What effect does the lack of representation at the federal level have on policy and programs that address gun violence in the district? Uh, great question. I, I, I definitely think that in terms of how we are, the inability for us to advocate for um, for federal dollars and, and advocate for uh, policies that represent uh, district residents has a it has a significant impact on number on a number of people who um, could be saved by the resources that are provided through the federal government. So representation uh, without tax aid, well, representation even though we're being taxed is quite important. And we know that's the slogan in, in Washington, DC. So I wanna ask you a question that I'm sure you've been asked, I don't know, several times during the pandemic. Um, you know, the significant uptick in, in gun violence in our cities across the country, gun violence that, as you know, disproportionately affects black communities. I was wondering if you might offer your thoughts on the uptick. Uh, and here's my twist on it and whether there's a natural relationship between the uptick and something you talked about in your presentation today, structural violence. So we know that COVID affected black communities disproportionately in ways that other communities were not impacted. And, and I would say that one of the, one of the ways in just in terms of employment. Uh, we had many people who were who lost their jobs in, in these communities, which is also, you know, a, a form of, in many ways, a form of structural violence that we could not continue. In, in many of the communities, people were unemployed before the pandemic. So the pandemic exacerbated these issues. Um, 
Also, just in terms of issues around, around housing, we have in the District of Columbia, we have a housing crisis where the most rapidly gentrifying city in the United States, which creates, uh, which increases the cost of housing for many of the district residents. And so what we also find is that people are struggling to find housing. Um, but I would say just in terms of, you know, we could speculate what happened during COVID in terms of structural violence, but we really need to do more research to uncover whether there were structural factors that contributed to the increase in gun violence, which we really don't have a great, a good idea right now because we just haven't conducted enough research to, to make that determination. I have another question. I'm not sure we'll have enough time, but we'll try our best. Sure. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, and you mentioned this in, uh, in the documentary, uh, life after the gunshot the interplay between the you know cultural violence direct violence and structural violence and the effect on black men i know it's a big question and we have about a minute so uh, i'll dive into more in terms of of structural violence and and the ways that structural violence contributes to to interpersonal violence um we see we see violence across and i don't want to be just specific with black men in washington dc because structural violence is a, is a global crisis and we typically see in nations that are impacted by structural violence increases in violence just across the board and so living in a community where there are lack of access to mental health services a lack of access to to medical services the increase in the surveillance of of young black men in those communities that entangle them in the criminal justice system. And so I, I want an and the erasure of history, which is really an important uh, facet and component of structural violence is, is how history has been erased. So if you, if you combine all of these things uh, in, in their totality, these factors contribute to young black men engaging and in, in being victims of interpersonal violence, which decreases the life expectancy of, of many of the young men that we work with. But I want to also acknowledge that structural violence is preventable. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and that's why it's so violent because we can prevent poverty. We can prevent food deserts. We can prevent medical deserts. We can prevent the disproportionate number of young black men and women going into the criminal justice system. And so when we choose to allow harm to be perpetrated and perpetuated against specific groups of, of people, knowing that that harm could lead to death, regardless of what how you frame it, that's murder. And we need to call structural violence for what it is. Um, ultimately, um, that those are some of the reasons why we we see it playing out in terms of interpersonal violence. I see one more question. Do funders understand providing Chromebooks? Uh, they do. Some of them do. And and what we what we found is that it bridges the equity. Uh, it's an equity intervention in terms of the lack of transportation, but also in, in the Chromebooks, even though we're, we were using Chromebooks primarily because we could not conduct human subjects research in person during COVID, the, the Chromebooks also bridge the equity divide in terms of the digital divide, right? Because we, we have young men who may not have access to Wi-Fi. And in fact, we find that many of the young people that we work with they don't have internet service. And so they often use free Wi-Fi in order to get onto, onto the internet. And so this is, this is one of the ways that, or two of the ways that we can bridge that gap, but we also need to make funders more aware that using uh, Uber or Lyft to get young people to the services in a safe way, which is what they acknowledge why they appreciate uh, Uber and Lyft, and also the Chromebooks as a way of connecting to to peer healing um, when they're unable to connect to 
uh, peer healing in a, in a brick and mortar space. And so these are ways that we can bridge the equity gaps that uh, we're experiencing with the young men that we work with and women. Well, Dr. Richardson, I want to thank you for being with us on our first annual research day for a very powerful presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I, and, I, and sorry about the beginning. I didn't know that I was, wasn't up, but, you know. It's fine. Happen. There may be some glitches, but we'll work it out. It's no problem. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me.